There we go. Well, good morning to our Facebook audience. We had some difficulties there, so apologize for that. But we are back to the live stream for, I don't know, the first time in three or four weeks now. Um, you've been seeing recording of Crossing Color Lines um, and actually a message that this congregation saw last week. So welcome. As always, feel free to like, comment, share. Let us know you're out there. We appreciate that. Uh, join us in worship this morning as we sing. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, a Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah's head and all
said. Amen. I'm going to read a passage of scripture and then we'll close with one more song this morning. Psalm 145, <clears throat> excuse me, says, I exalt you, my God the King, and bless your name forever and ever. I will bless you every day. I will praise your name forever and ever. The Lord is great and is highly praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation will declare your works to the next and will proclaim your mighty acts. I will speak of your splendor and glorious majesty and your wondrous works. They will proclaim the power of your awe-inspiring acts and I will declare your greatness. They will give a testimony of your great goodness and will joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and great in faithful love. The Lord is good to everyone. His compassion rests on all he has made. All you have made will thank you, Lord. The faithful will bless you. They will speak of the glory of your kingdom and will declare your might, informing all people of your mighty acts and of the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your rule is for all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his actions. The Lord helps all who fall. He raises up all who are oppressed. All eyes look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all his acts. The Lord is near all who call out to him, all who call out to him with integrity. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry for help and saves them. The Lord guards all those who love him, but he destroys all the wicked. My mouth will declare the Lord's praise. Let every living thing bless his holy name forever and ever. In my life, Lord, be glorified. Thank you, Karen. 
if you have been uh, following along with us, uh, whether in, in the building or uh, on our little Facebook Live live stream, uh, you know that we've been in this series, The Heart of a King. And we're going to kind of wrap it up a little bit today, but we may come back to it next year because we haven't even got to Solomon yet. Our goal was to look at Saul and David and Solomon, and we're coming towards the end of David, and I wanted to... As we come towards Thanksgiving and Christmas, I wanted to move into some different things, uh, so we'll put this on hold today. This will be a last message uh, from 2 Samuel chapter 19. We worked our way through most of 1 Samuel uh, and most of 2 Samuel. We're just going to read uh, a few verses here uh, in 2 Samuel to introduce us to the theme, uh, and then we'll close with some verses in Acts that I'll have on the screen for you. But when we ended uh, this series on the live stream, it was several weeks ago, but for us here in the building... Uh, it was last week. When we last left David, he was mourning for his son Absalom, who had, uh, over a number of years, cultivated this rebellion. And Absalom would remember he would stand in the gate, and anybody would come in with something that David should have been doing is uh, getting seeking justice for those people. Absalom's kind of saying, "Well, there's nobody here to do that, but if I was king, and remember he did that for a number of years, and it says, and he won the hearts of Israel." Uh, and then it turned into a, an absolute rebellion after that, uh, raising up an army, uh, and David fled the city for a while, and then it ended up coming back because ultimately his warriors were uh, defeated, Absalom's warriors, and that's kind of where we pick it up. Absalom was killed in that battle by uh, David's general, um, jo Joab, right? I'm trying to get him confused. I think it was Joab, but we'll see his name later. He's going to appear in the story later today. Um, and then right here he is in verse 1. So let's look at that here in 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 1. It was reported to Joab, the king is weeping. He's mourning over Absalom. And verse 2 says, That day's victory was turned into mourning for all the troops, because on that day the troops heard the king is grieving over his son. Now keep in mind that these are the troops that had just defeated Absalom, those who rebelled against David. So how does that feel if you've been fighting for the king against his own rebellious son, and you win that battle, and you come back in, and all the king is doing is crying about his son that has been killed in the battle? How does that make you feel? Not very good, and that's what Joab senses here. Look at verse 3. It says, So they returned to the city quietly that day, like troops come in when they are humiliated after fleeing in battle. So when they come back from this victory, and they find out that David is mourning, they really come in humiliated, feeling like they really lost the battle. Look at verse 4. But the king covered his face and cried loudly, My son Absalom, Absalom, my son, my son. And it also said that exact phrase at the end of chapter 18 there, as we read. Now at this point, David's acting more like, uh, and we've talked about the different roles that a, king's, that a king filled, but he's acting more like the father of a dead son, than a king of a nation, or a commander-in-chief of an army. Now go to verse 5. Then Joab, that general, went into the house to the king and said, Today you have shamed all your soldiers, those who saved your life as well as your sons, your wives, and your concubines, by loving your enemies and hating those who love you. Today you have made it clear that the commanders and soldiers mean nothing to you. In fact, today I know that if Absalom were alive, and all of us were dead, it would be fine with you. That's some pretty harsh words. Um, but what we need to remember about Joab is that Joab is, is never um, a man for sympathy. He often just acts on the king's behalf. He is a very dutiful, responsible general. When Joab sees a threatening of the king's reign and rule and leadership, Joab usually quenches it right there. And that's what happened with Absalom, even though... They went out, and David said, don't be, he said, he said, be gentle with my son Absalom. Joab ends up having him killed intentionally because he sees that Absalom is a threat to David's kingdom. And now Joab is aware that even though Absalom was in fact a leader of this long-nurtured rebellion against David, and the people will realize, as Joab points out, that David cares more about his son than the kingdom. And I think... Uh, Joab can classify himself when he talks about the people who humiliate, the troops come in when they're humiliated after fleeing in battle. Joab's got to feel that way too. He's the one that was leading this army against this rebellion, and he comes back, and all the king can think about is his son. And Joab is, is ultimately responsible for Absalom's death. He's not the first person uh, that, that Joab has killed without David's consent. So we also might want to pick up a little bit here. This is not the first occasion, there's a little bit of friction and tension. 
between Joab and David. David's got to walk a, a tightrope on a number of occasions, and he hasn't done it exceptionally well in some cases. He does a little bit better today. Look at verse 7. This is Joab speaking still. He says, Now get up, go out, and encourage your soldiers. For I swear by the Lord that if you don't go out, not a man will remain with you tonight. This will be worse for you than all the trouble that has come to you from your youth until now. Joab says, if you don't go out and make a and let these troops know that you appreciate what they did, this is going to be really bad, the worst thing you've ever seen. And as I look at this, I'm, I'm trying to picture this scene in my mind, and I keep flashing back to the number of, any sort of political movie, and you can picture the president's right hand man. Let's say that some catastrophe or accident has happened, and the president just can't decide what to do. And you see his right man standing there and says, President, you have to do this. You know, And that's what Joab's doing here. He's the president's right hand man, in this case the king, saying, You've got to take action. This has got to be done, or this is going to be a major problem. Uh, he, he Basically, he tells David three things. Get up, go out, and speak kindly. Which I thought, well, that's a great way to apply it. We could spend the, you know, the rest of this message on that. We're not going to do it this morning. But Joab's message to David could be the message to all of us, all the time. Get up, go out, and speak kindly. Look at verse 8. Well, how, does, how does David respond? So the king got up and sat in the city gate where he should have been the whole time. Remember, Absalom has been taking that place instead of where David should have been. And all the people were told, look, the king is sitting in the city gate. It's almost like he's, he's saying, okay, we're back in business. I'm the king. I'm here to do the duties of a king. Then they all came into the king's presence. Remember where, I said this, you remember where Absalom was all that time building the rebellion? When David wasn't in the gate, Absalom was there. And now David has taken over that spot again. And it said that at that point, that when Absalom was there, that he had won the hearts of the people of Israel. One commentator says that David returned to the city gate, where he had reviewed the troops as they headed to battle, this battle with Absalom. And it was also at the gate that Absalom had stolen the heart of many of David's subjects, when David was supposedly neglecting his duties of administering justice. So his returning to the gate amounted to a return to normality. And it's almost like all this tension that we've been seeing happening over, I think it was like seven years now, is, is kind of residing to the side. And what do we see? We see David in mourning about uh, what should be a successful thing. So the, what, the point, one of the points that I want to make today is that David nearly loses his kingdom because Joab says, this is a tragic thing. If you don't handle this, this is going to be really bad. And we're going to see that in the next couple of verses. But David nearly loses his kingdom because he is so lamenting the loss of his son and and, and, the, uh, and the past. Look at verse, the rest of verse 8 there. Meanwhile, each Israelite had fled to his tent. People throughout all the tribes of Israel were arguing among themselves, saying, now this doesn't read very well in English, uh, so I'm, I'll probably explain this to it, but do, do the best we can on the way through. The king rescued us from the grasp of our enemies, and he saved us from the grasp of the Philistines. But now he has fled from the land because of Absalom. That was in the past. He's back now. Verse 10, but Absalom, the man we anointed over us, has died in battle. So why do you say nothing about restoring the king? Now, that's, it's kind of confusing the way that reads. So what is going on is the people are kind of in a quandary about this. Because when David left, some of them anointed, at least the troops of Israel, anointed Absalom to be king. So saying, we remember back in the past when David was a mighty warrior and fought for us. And, but now Absalom has come and we anointed him. And now he's dead, but now David's back, but David has not assumed the duties of a king. So they're kind of about, well, what do we, what do, we do here? Are we going to make David king again? Who do we anoint? And there's confusion about whom they should follow. Absalom is dead, but David is really not inspiring us, even though now he's back in the gate. And in verse 13, excuse me, verse 11, uh, David calls on these priests to say, okay, you need to get the priests involved to, to make me, anoint me king of Judah, win the hearts of the people of Judah. And he does that. It's one of the first uh, political moves that he does here. The second one is in verse 13. Uh, he wants to settle uh, his kind of, remember I told you about that grudge that he kind of has with Joab for killing Absalom when he didn't want him to? He's not only going to settle his personal grudge with Joab, but he's going to win back the rest of Israel because he, there's this guy who is Absalom's general whose name is Amasa. Uh, and the people who were following Absalom and Amasa, David says, I'm going to make Amasa, he's going to take Joab's place. So he's not only removing Joab from the picture because he's angry with his disobedience, but he's also going to win back the hearts of those who were following Absalom by appointing this guy named Amasa. And that's what happens 
That's one of the really, like I said, one of the really first political things that we see David do. Verse 14. Uh, so he won over all the men of Judah, and they unanimously sent word to the king, Come back, you and all your servants. Uh, note a couple things there. Some verses say he won over the hearts of the men of Judah. So that they sent, hey, come back. Another passage says that he captured their hearts. So it's the, the opposite of that phrase that we saw that Absalom had done in the past. Now their hearts are back with David. And we're, uh, we're titling this message today, the rest of, uh, Restoring the Kingdom. Because it's, uh, this is what we see happening coming back to David. So uh, as we come through this passage, that's all the verses we're going to read uh, from 2 Samuel today. I got and I had an interesting question in my mind. What happens if David is not able to pull it all together? What happens if his mourning for Absalom, maybe he goes before the troops and he just can't do anything but moan and weep and sob for Absalom, and the troops get the idea that even though he's saying the right words, he's still crying about Absalom. He doesn't mean anything he says. What if they perceive that it's all just a show? Does David lose his kingdom? Would he have... Now what's going to happen in the next couple chapters is there are a few rebellions. David's going to be called back, the people call him back, and they want to anoint him. But there's still a few stragglers here and there who have some followers. We're not going to spend time on those, but you can read those in chapter 20 and I think maybe 21. So I wanted to apply that to us today. Would David, if he had not been able to pull it all together, would he have been able to fulfill what God had called him to do? And here's how I want to apply that to us. We are, uh, as always, it seems like, still living in difficult, you know, all those, uh, all those words, all those adjectives we use, uh, trying, turbulent, all the things that we see in the commercial. These trying times or whatever, we're still living there. It's divisive, it's depressing, and people are experiencing this thing in so many different ways. And I think in some ways we are experiencing this like David. We're a little bit hesitant because we're not sure. We are sometimes, we're so worried about what the past was like. Are we ever going to get back to a new normal, Right? We think about, is, is anything that we're going to do going forward, are we ever going to be able to, to wear these masks? Are we ever going to be able uh, to hug each other and shake hands and do all the things we've done in the past? And I think we're, we get caught in the sense of, of where David is just mourning for his son. He's hung up on what is, rather than still what God has called him to be as the king of Israel. We could use any number of adjectives, these trying times, these hard times. And people, but it, here's the, here's, Slightly encouraging, I guess. It's not just our country. People around the world are experiencing this thing. So think about it. All places around the world are experiencing this pandemic and different restrictions, and I get all that stuff, but we're all facing the world with a new perspective. And it's into this perspective that the gospel and the hope of Jesus Christ still speak loudly and clearly, but now it's to all men because we're facing the same thing. And God's people said... The hope and the gospel is still the primary calling, despite difficult days. Um, some would say, well, we should have an election, right? Well, here in the United States, we're going to have an election. Can I go boldly into the future? It's not going to make a big difference who we elect in the United States about the pandemic and all those sorts of things, right? We're still going to be facing this, some say for another year until we get a vaccine. Uh, the, studies, the studies are showing that even when they have a vaccine, not everybody's going to take it, so we're going to continue on. So a vaccine and a president aren't going to heal it. What's going to heal it is the hope and the good news of Jesus Christ, looking forward to, to what he can do. So we may feel, uh, I'm, I'm sarcastically suggesting that an election is the right thing. So hear me, it's not the answer to this. So we may feel as if our lives have been put on hold, as we worry about jobs and income and just being able to, to shake hands again. And David has just come through these trying circumstances, a, a rebellion that's led by his son. And now he's appointed uh, a, a new general. And he's had to interrupt mourning his son to rally the troops. He must perform the duties of the king. He's the commander-in-chief. Or if he doesn't do that, he's, he's risking destroying the morale of those who fought for him to overthrow Absalom's rebellion. As I was thinking this through about what, what would we say to David in a moment, what do you say to David to get him to, to buck up, you know? Uh, I mean, given he's lost his son, and we don't want to bypass that as something insignificant, because it is significant. But God's calling on his life is greater and bigger than that. And I was thinking about that. Um, I don't know if I've shared this with you before. You, hopefully you guys know this. I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan. Have I told you that before? 
You don't know. Maybe I have. I am a huge Lord of the Rings fan. You can ask my kids. They are so bored with me watching it over and over and over. I do it while I'm working. It's just, it's kind of a soothing thing for me. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Lord of the Rings? You know what it is. It was a book. Now it's movies and so forth. So there's this passage in the book. It's a quote. It's one of the more famous quotes. I'm, um, I'm not uh, digging deep for stuff here. But there's a character in the book who's, his name is Gandalf. He's kind of like the wise sage of this. And then there's a, another character who's Frodo and his, his burden is to carry the ring to complete the mission. Uh, and they get to a difficult, uh, a difficult place in this mission. And Frodo, who's carrying the ring, says, uh, I wish it need not have happened in my time. He started to lament what has happened to him, how difficult this journey has become, this, how hard this mission. And Gandalf, the wise one, says, so do I. And so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. And I know that's not scripture, but as I read that quote, I'm like, that's what God is saying to each one of us. The days are not for us to decide. All we can do is decide what we're going to do with the time that God has given us. So to bring about and restore the kingdom of God, to go forward with the gospel, we cannot be caught up in the past or the present circumstances. It doesn't change the mission that we're called to. The power of our Christian faith is not that we have just the hope and strength to endure and make it through difficult days. The power of the Christian faith is that we have the presence of God during and in those days. It's that that's what people see about us. Not that we're just struggling to make it through. We're just gasping for breath. But that we are powerful and triumphant and, and renewed and recharged by the hope of the gospel in those times. Uh, I want to turn once again, this is about to be on the scripture for you, Acts chapter 17, to remind you that God has put us in this time and these days specifically. One of my favorite verses here, uh, this is Paul at Mars Hill, Acts 17, 26. Paul is speaking, he says, From one man he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth. And really, this is the part I want you to see. And has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. He did this so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Paul says, God has determined the times and the boundaries of where you live, that you would live where you live right now in 2020 in the midst of a pandemic. God knew about it. He has determined that you would be there. And Paul says, and he did this, verse 27, it doesn't change the mission because of the times that you're in. He did this so that what? That people might seek God, even in the midst of a pandemic. As we all have this, this idea, this virus in our mind, we're all facing life the same way. The hope of the gospel comes and covers the whole world. We don't have to so compartmentalize it and, and adjust and shift to who we're speaking to. So that perhaps people might reach out and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. In the midst of our depression and discouragement, God is determined. And he has determined what we should be. He's determined that men find him. In the midst of David's problems, God had determined purpose. In, in David's broken family, God is already binding the wounds. God is determined to accomplish the work of the gospel, to bring hope to the hopeless. And freedom from the captives, Isaiah 61, all the things that Jesus said. And I don't know what you personally are feeling today, whether you're watching online at home or whether you're in the building with us. I don't know how deep the darkness or the depression, how, how much this pandemic has got to you, how much social and financial and economic crisis you are facing. I don't know how deep the darkness is, but I know this. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Think about this. Jesus says, you might see darkness around you, but you don't have to walk in it. Anyone who follows with me will have the light of life. You may think it's the end, but Jesus says, follow me. The light is just around the corner. You don't have to stay there in that place. He would say, take courage and be bold. God's kingdom marches on. The mistakes and the errors and the faults and the sins and hesitations of our past, the things that slow us up, have not slowed God up at all. He is not short-circuited or hindered or delayed. He's not taken by surprise by 2020 at all. He has appointed the times and the days, and he's determined that people will find him even in that. 
every um, every week we get prayer. There's a prayer update that comes from a denominational office, uh, and I was reading through those this week. Uh, and one of them said, "Well, I go, that's exactly what I'm going to be speaking about on Sunday." But it has a m number of things you can pray about, both for your country, your leaders, your local, whatever. Uh, and the one that struck my mind, it says this, pray that the challenges of the day will not distract us from the work of making disciples. And I'm trying to, and that's, I'm trying to apply that because I think that's what had happened with David. He had this mission and purpose to lead the nation of Israel. And because of his, his lamenting the past and this terrible thing that had happened to him, he was distracted and he almost lost the kingdom. That's the same thing for us. So even in the midst of these difficult and trying days, we still have a mission and a purpose to move forward into. God has determined that we were to live here, that we're going to be here, that we still have something to do. And I was reminded as I thought about that, that the challenges of the day would not distract us from the work of making disciples. I was reminded of how the, the early church responded in the book of Acts. And in that story, in, in Acts chapter uh, 4, Peter and John are arrested and they're warned and said, stop preaching in the name of Jesus and about the resurrection. It's just a fascinating passage to read. And, and there's this man who Peter and John had healed. He, was, he had been blind, and he's standing there, and Peter and John had healed him. And the, uh, the, the rulers and the Pharisees, were, they, ask, uh, they ask Peter and John, by what power, whose name did you do this in? And, and Peter, the text says, he's filled with the Spirit. It says, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you healthy. I love Peter's boldness. He's always got this boldness. So it's like, Peter, John, don't talk about the name of Jesus and don't talk about the resurrection. But by the way, this blind guy, whose name did you do that in? Peter doesn't hesitate, does he? Let it be known to all of you. It's the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he throws out a little, whom you crucified. And whom God raised from the dead. He manages to talk about the resurrection too. The two things they don't want to talk about. Peter talks about them both. And that's some boldness. And verse 14 there says that since the man was standing there, they had nothing to say in opposition. Right? The guy who was blind can now see. This is how Peter said he did. There's nothing we can say about it. So they end up, they end up sending Peter and John. And they threaten him. Um, and they say, don't speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. In verse 19, Peter and John answered them. Whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you, rather than to God, you decide. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Right? They have experienced, Peter says he's filled with the Spirit when he answers this. The presence of God is with them. They have walked with Jesus. They can't stop talking about what they are experiencing. Being with Jesus changed them. And even in verse 13 it says that these were just common fishermen, but people noted that they had been with Jesus which is another fascinating verse. But here in Acts chapter 4, verse 23, the story continues on. It says, After they were released, they went to their own people and reported everything that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. Hey, guys, we're not allowed to talk about the name of Jesus, right? When they heard this, they raised their voices together to God and said, Master, you are the one who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and everything in them. You said through the Holy Spirit, by the mouth of our father David, your servant. Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot futile things? The kings of earth take their stand and the rulers assemble together against the Lord and against his Messiah. They look back in, at Psalms and say, this was prophesied that people were going to stand against the, the Jesus. Verse 27, for in fact, in this city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel assembled together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, to do whatever your hand and your will had predestined to take place. God, the rulers assembled, Herod Pontius Pilate, tried to make it no, but I love how that ends, to do whatever uh, they assembled against us, but you still did whatever your hand and your will had predestined to take place. Verse 29, And now, Lord, consider their threats. They're threatening us, and grant that your servants may speak your word with all boldness. They didn't say, release us from the persecution or make them leave us alone. They said, it doesn't matter what they do to us. It doesn't matter the situation or the circumstances we live in. Give us boldness. While you stretch out your hand for healing and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. See, we might say, Lord, consider our situation. Consider the darkness around us and give us grace to not do what you ask us to do. But that's not what Peter and John are doing. Lord, the depression and the discouragement of our people 
Enable us to speak your word with boldness. This is still what God is calling us to. Verse 31 there. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God boldly. Interestingly enough, it's not just Peter and John anymore. Did you see who all is now speaking the word of God boldly? We told Peter and John to be quiet. They went and prayed to ask God for boldness. And now everyone is there begins to speak the word of God boldly. I don't know how many people were there. But now this thing is a spread into a mass movement of all over the world. So I'd conclude with this today. In the midst of these difficulties, I'm so tired of saying that phrase, right? It's like it's a, it's a qualifier for everything. The pandemic has put a stop on things, or we have to view things differently, or think about it. And I have to tell you, as children of God, we don't have to think differently about anything because of a pandemic. Our mission and our calling is still the same. All we need to be asking for is boldness and the work of the Spirit in us and Christ's presence with us. But in the midst of his difficult days, David's kingdom was finally restored to him. He was able to pull it together. And I, my prayer for us this morning, may we be the people who speak boldly and fulfill God's purpose in the darkest days. May that be said and be true of us that we now speak more boldly despite the days, not because of them. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for your word again, the truth that speaks to us. We pray that we would not be overwhelmed or consumed by the difficulty, the darkness, the depression, all the things around us that would distract us from the purpose that you have given, but that we would be bold and courageous knowing that our mission has not changed. You are not surprised. You are still ruling and on the throne. You are still in control. Your plan will still come to be. We call ourselves your children, but also your servants. Give us wisdom to see the places, the opportunities that you lay before us. Give us the courage to act on them. Give us the right words to say. Lord, and if even more difficult and darker days come, may the light of your truth through us shine even brighter. We thank you for the words of, that Paul wrote to the church of Thessalonica. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with full assurance. You know how we lived among you for your benefit. And you yourself became imitators of us and of the Lord. When in spite of severe persecution, you welcomed the message with joy from the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless. Have a great week. As well to our Facebook audience. We'll see you next time.